Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Nick Cowing and his guest, FIA President Jean Tote. You sit here, Jean. Please don't go for lunch yet because you won't get any lunch quite yet. Uh, we're going to discuss road safety and safety uh, for the next 35 minutes and uh, Frank Williams and Michel Yeo will, will join us. So uh, let me keep the momentum from this morning going and thank you for your uh, patience and stamina um, would, for what has been a very rich look at the landscape of so many issues to do uh, with sport. Jean Taut, uh, President of the FIA, what is your message, given that you have been working incredibly hard on the business of road safety? And you've got your 10 principles. You have them there in a folio. Are people listening to you? Oh, thank you. I mean, good morning to everybody. I mean, I'm delighted uh, to be here. It has been a very interesting morning speaking about uh, different uh, challenges. And uh, it's fascinating to see this region so much uh, involved uh, with the sport, with uh, great programs. And uh, maybe before speaking about uh, road safety, uh, I could spend a, a few words about the development of motorsport in, uh, in the region. And we just had uh, earlier uh, Nasser al -Taya. Well, could I just press you though, first of all, when we're just hearing about motorsport in that way, before you talk about the development, um, when you when you think of this, when you know as you know yourself as a driver, the speeds at which people are are, are, are driving, uh, particularly and in, in the kind of conditions we've just heard uh, from the previous panelists, uh, what is the connection between that and what you're trying to do in road safety? I mean, it's two different things, you know, on uh, on the road, on uh, on the tracks, you can. Uh, demonstrate uh, your skills uh, during uh, rallying, during uh, racing, and uh, then when you become a road car user, whoever it is, you have to be a proper citizen. And unfortunately, uh, road safety around the world is uh, among the worst scourge of uh, our society. Every year, you have 1.3 million people who die on the road. You have 50 million people who are injured. And 90% uh, of those figures are in developing countries. If you take a little country like uh, Qatar, 1.7 million people every year, you have uh, around 300 people who die on the roads, uh, and uh, you have a few thousands of people who are injured. The cost for the whole society, we are talking about finances, uh, over $500 billion. And at the actual trend, by 2020, you could have 2 million people dying on the roads and 80 million people being injured. So we need to act, and uh, we are working very closely together with the UN, uh, United Nations, and we are participating to this decade of action, 2011-2020. We are working with the uh, World Bank, we are working with the World Health Organization, and with all our clubs in 140 countries around the world to address the problem, as the problem has been addressed on tuberculosis, malaria, it's that serious. HIV. I mean, it, become, it will become over. Road, it, road it, accident will be among the strongest scourges in the society, are already, and will become probably among the first top three. Well, we'll talk with Michel as well about that, your, your ambassador on this, but when you say scourge, like a disease, um, how is that therefore being received? Are you trying to change the image of the issue of road safety and the image of the terrible side of it, which is the number of people injured and killed? In other words, people up to now have accepted it, but are they getting to the point where they don't accept it so readily? I mean, we, we want to put that ahead of the priority of the governments around the world. And it has been the case in uh, developed countries. And you had President Sarkozy, who has been doing, uh, together with the uh, former President uh, Chirac, a great uh, job uh, in, uh, in France, 
from 20,000 uh, fatalities uh, 20 years ago. Now France uh, has about 4,000 uh, fatalities. So, uh, I mean, great result. Why and how? Through education, law enforcement, road infrastructure, and uh, the fleet, the level of the fleet of, uh, of the vehicles. But it's probably something we can uh, talk and develop uh, earlier. And in some developing countries, you know, you must bear in mind that uh, in a lot of countries, the uh, average of age of a road car is about uh, between 30 to 60 years old age. So when we speak about new technology, about ABS, about ESC, electronic stability control, unfortunately, it is not available. And, uh, you know, in a lot of countries around the world, and it will be very interesting to have Michelle, Michelle witnessing about that when she has been traveling to, to Vietnam, uh, or to Africa, because, I mean, a boy or a girl to go at school, and here we have students who have not this problem, but unfortunately, in a lot of uh, countries around the world, to go at school or to come back from school is just like going to war for the children, because there is no uh, war cross for them, and they are challenging, they are putting their life in danger to go to school or to come back to school, as I was mentioning earlier. And this problem has not been yet properly addressed. Well, let's pick up on those points in a, in a couple of minutes when uh, Michel and Frank come onto the platform. But we've just been listening to Nasser and Sebastian uh, talking about uh, their experiences and their incredible experiences and also their incredible successes as well, not just in, uh, in motorsport, but also more broadly, as we, we, we heard from, from Nasser. What is your reflection about how things are changing in this region, which you wanted to talk about a moment ago? So, I mean, first of all, now uh, motor racing has become very popular in this part of the world. Uh, we are hosting one uh, Formula One Grand Prix in Abu Dhabi. We are hosting one Formula One uh, Grand Prix in uh, Bahrain. Uh, Qatar has a great uh, facilities, a great uh, circuit where they are hosting a Moto Grand Prix, and uh, they were the first to introduce some uh, night racing. Uh, they are developing a cross-country rally, and uh, I mean Nasser has been uh, starting to to train uh, here in uh, in the region, and it's a lot of development for motorsport, uh, which is uh, achieved. And I know that uh, they have much more ambition uh, for the future. So um, it's great to see the development of uh, motorsport uh, about uh, the region in Middle East uh, with uh, implementation of absolutely amazing uh, facilities. And we see when uh, those people decide to develop something, they don't do it. They do it properly. They do it uh, well. and. Uh, I really hope that uh, they will have uh, the same way of addressing the problem on road safety. But maybe something, because um, I mean, a lot of people here may uh, may wonder why we are talking about uh, road safety, attending to a sport uh, forum, to a sport event. And for me, there is, amongst uh, the reason, a good point, which is a society point. Uh, road safety is part of the priority problem to be solved by the society. And the sporting community is very strong. We have seen this morning. And uh, I've uh, initiated uh, some uh, relationship with the uh, IOC, with the uh, main uh, sporting federation to help us to address the problem. Are you of saying that those safety. in sport should be, uh, should be role models on this? I mean, they, Because uh, everyone, I'm sure, or most people drive cars one way or the other. Uh, you know, it, it was, again, it was addressed the, this morning when a politician is claiming road safety. He had not the same credibility, if I may say, that uh, if uh, Nasser al Taya or Sebastian Loeb are claiming for road safety. And, uh, you know, we have ambassadors like Michael Schumacher, like uh, Sebastian Vettel uh, also, and a lot of champions. And we, we want to have on board. And this morning, I was just sitting next to Oscar Pistorius, and he said, mm, I love motorsport. And I said, but you have to be one of our ambassadors. And uh, 
all the top sportsmen can and have to become road safety ambassador to address the problem. And, uh, you know, we, we, need, we need to see a, re a reaction. As well, let's, let's build earlier. that forward, because let's invite Michel and Sir Frank uh, up onto the platform uh, to come and uh, join us uh, to keep uh, discussing road safety. How many of you out there would like to uh, join the discussion using a microphone? I can't see you very well, but if there's anyone who'd like to come in, uh, please do, particularly on this point of how sport, uh, those in sport, whether administrators or sports people uh, and stars, can be involved. Michel, welcome. Thank you very much indeed. Frank, welcome as well. Uh, you've been listening to what Jean has been saying. Can I see any hands going up at the moment? Not at all. Hands uh, are tired. Michel, would you like to pick up on, uh, on what Jean has been saying about, uh, about the, the challenge of off-road safety, particularly that it's now a scourge, a bit like a disease? What is, your, what is your impression as you go around the world trying to push this? Are you finding resistance? Or a bit like smoking, is it be becoming accepted that there is, this is a scourge? Well, uh, good afternoon, and it's a real pleasure and privilege to be here, especially, you know, seeing uh, icons and living legends that have been so inspirational and part of my life. Um, what we are talking about, actually, it's not so much a resistance rather than a um, puzzled look on a lot of people's faces when I say I'm claiming for road safety and... I actually had a young person turn around to me and say, well, I don't drive a car, so it doesn't involve me. I think there is a great misunderstanding what road safety is about. If you think about it, it is very much part of our everyday lives. The minute you walk out the door, you are on the roads. And if the roads are not uh, structured well to protect you, if your car or your motorbike, or you don't, you don't have the awareness or the education to understand how to protect yourself and your uh, children, then you are at real risk. Why we are calling it a scourge is simply because it, we do, it is a disease. We're treating it as a disease because the good news is we do have the vaccines. In this road safety issue, it's, uh, it could be a great success, which is the sum of efforts, small efforts, repeated day in, day out. What Jean has is the golden rules. And if you look at the golden rules, it is not rocket science. It is very simple. Uh, instructions. In fact, I'm sure things that all of us are very aware of. If you are in a car, you put on your safety belts. If you are, if you're riding on a motorcycle, you wear your safety helmets. So it's all these things that we need to put into good practice. And if we do, then we are in, in hand with the decade of action for road safety. Let me just summarize uh, without the sub clauses here. Belt up, respect the highway code, obey the speed limit, drive sober, protect my children, pay attention, stop when I'm tired, wear a helmet, be courteous and considerate, look after my vehicle. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> so why is it that there's still this gap between how obvious this is and those who spend money, buy a car, or they rent it, or they pick it up somewhere, borrow it, and they still don't quite get a bit like smoking, taking a cigarette. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know it's going to damage your health. You Sometimes know this people are fatalistic. Health. They think it's never going to happen to them. They think, you know, somebody else, uh, somebody else's fault. But the problem is, in a few seconds, your life could be dramatically changed. It How could do you be change very the tragic. Psyche? How do you change the psyche then? of all of us? Well, we have been working together with governments. It's awareness, campaign awareness, sometimes very brutal ones, like even the smoking ones, where we're in your face showing you the after effect, what could happen does to you. Does that make a difference? It does, because I and speaking to young children, um, having programs in school, because it's very interesting. When a young child learns what is the right thing to do, in fact, they go home and they teach their parents. Sometimes if you go into a car and if a young child knows that they have to belt up, they will remind you, you have to put on your safety belt. So it is these kind of awareness campaigns that we can do to facilitate, but each country have their own problems. Unfortunately, for example, here in the Middle Eastern countries, the highest fatalities are of the young people, people who have their license, they get out there, maybe it's an ego thing, maybe it's a moment of stupidity, they think that the faster they drive, it will show how smart they are. But that is absolutely not the case. 
Frank, uh, let me come to you, because let's broaden this out for the last 20 or so minutes, particularly on the issue of technology. Um, you've been involved for so long, so successfully, in developing the, the, the front end, the sharp end of technological achievement. Do you see a convergence now between the kind of things you're putting into a racing car and the kind of thing your scientists are putting into the, a racing car and the kind of very basic challenge for all of us human beings to understand how dangerous a car is, but also how much safer it can be and how much more safely you can drive it, even at speed? Well, there is a certain amount of convergence and a certain amount of similarity. Um, thank you. Um, but there's still quite a gap as well. And obviously, racing cars are immensely fast, but they have the benefit of having amazing circuit safety provision, especially the guardrails around the circuit. And in the event of an accident, there are always marshals instant to give a driver aid of any sort if it's so required. In a road accident, for instance, in mine, I flipped the car over when I should have known better, and it was about 30 minutes before an ambulance turned up, and then another 30 minutes drive to the hospital, all of which doesn't help. Um, but also, um, driving on a the road, there's no one there to control you, unless there's a policeman, and you always think you can do better. And as a young man, you tend to take risks that no one, a sensible human being would ever take. Were you complacent at that time? I was just mad. I was being a bit more polite and saying complacent. I mean, when you, okay, you say you're mad, but were you, were you not treating a car with respect? Well, in my own particular case, I drive home quite sensibly most nights, but once in a while I just try and pretend I was a racing driver because young men do feel the need for speed from time to time, and it's a good feeling if you are pretty adept in a race in a road car and slide it around a little bit when no one else is on the road. Uh, but inevitably, if you're not particularly skillful, you'll make a mistake, which is what I did. What about the, the potential, uh, all of you now, for in, in a car, in a saloon, however you want to define that vehicle, there are devices now to warn you that you're overdoing it. Do you think, Frank, that that would have affected you that, at that time when it, it was nearly fatal for you? Well, probably not, just speaking stupidly for myself. I always thought I knew better, and young men tend to think like that. Can you see that changing, though, that the culture is changing at all? Well, I mean, it's 30 years ago since I did that, so things clearly have changed, but I can't speak for the youth of today, but I'm sure there are still some madcaps out there somewhere. Michel, how much does um, an example like Frank um, help you in your campaigns? Because whether it be the icons of sport who are successful, it's also the icons of those mm -hmm. who've suffered disaster, which brings us on to how motorsport can be used to uh, encourage people to realize that it may be fun if you're in sport, but also there's, there is significant yeah. danger. Um, I've been actually doing a documentary around the world. It's called Dying for School. Uh, it seems ironic. Today we were talking about how education is so important for the youth of for the future. And um, in particularly the developing nations, like in Africa, in India, in Southeast Asia, in South America, these children walk to school. They don't have the luxury of cars. Some don't even have the luxury of buses or public transportation. And I remember when I was filming there, um, very early in the morning, and in this very fast road, highways, um, and I could see shadows flitting across, you know, with these big headlights coming, these fast cars coming and trucks coming down the road. And I realized very quickly they were young children who were trying to get to school. And they were more afraid of being uh, scolded by the, the teacher for being late than these cars coming at a high speed towards them. It is very, very tragic um, that around the world that a lot of children, they go to school and all that comes home is a knapsack. And we have from Vietnam, from Cambodia, from Africa, and in fact, the grandchild of Nelson Mandela is also a poster child presently, who wants, parents want to show the rest of the children and parent, other parents to, to make them realize, please don't let this happen to your child. And it is, Unfortunately, when you look at the numbers, 1.3 million killed, and every 60, 
Every 30 seconds, there is a child hurt or killed on the roads around the world. Whatever we are doing is not fast enough. But the thing is, if we don't start now, it will just get progressively worse. What do you do in a country like Vietnam, which has, I think, one of the highest densities of mm -hmm. use of mopeds and yes. motorbikes? 26 and, million. And kids aspire to that motorbike almost at the age of 10 if they can afford it. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, it, there's that create there's a culture of accessibility to mm -hmm. two wheels. We have to work very closely with the government. Uh, since we started the program about four years ago, they finally enacted the law that they have to wear safety, safety helmets. And overnight, literally overnight, because we were monitoring, we were collecting data, you could see uh, an increase of 89% of motorbike users putting on their safety helmets. And that has helped tremendously towards, uh, contributed towards the less fatalities on the road. And awareness. Sorry? And awareness, being and aware. Awareness. Yes. We do a lot of campaigns. Uh, we do have this program where it's uh, safety helmets for children, where I've gone back uh, a few times now, and we've distributed safety helmets to the children to ensure that they will. It's not that they don't have the safety helmets. People have to understand the rules are not there to inconvenience you or give you a bad hair day. A lot of the times people actually think, I'm just going round the corner, so I don't need a safety helmet. But it's just round the corner that's something very tragic that can happen. Frank and Jean, uh, where is technology taking us in this? It's always too easy to rely on technology, but after all, think of what the airbag has done, even though there are some downsides to airbags. Frank, can you sketch for us where is technology taking us on road, car, vehicle safety, based on what you know from your team? Well, I know very little about it because I don't have any real relationship with any motor car manufacturer. Clearly, they take the issue of road safety very, very significantly. I've visited several very well-known factories, and they all have enormous safety rigs. do a lot of crash tests, which are immensely expensive. They, take it, they spend a great deal of money on this issue. Um, beyond that, uh, I can't really answer your question. But in terms of what the driver see in, in a motor racing, motor racing team is seeing and feeling in his, in his cockpit, are there things coming down the track there which could somehow influence the average driver, even in a cheaper car? Well, certainly the road car of today is far safer than, say, 10 and 20 years ago because it has better tyres, better road adhesion, better brakes, better steering response. And of course, better crash structures built into the cars are fundamental. It's definitely an advance. Because, John, what, what, here is point 10 look after my vehicle. It's all very well having better tyres, but you've got to keep them inflated correctly. What do you see technologically coming down the track? There are now many cars, for example, which will read the pressure in your tyre without you having to get out and spend 50p and test it. I will say the actual revolution. Uh, which is uh, now applied in uh, most of the new cars is ESC, electronic stability control. And, uh, How does that work? Could you tell us? I mean, it's anti-skid. So it means that when uh, you will normally lose the control of your car, electronically, the car will be balanced again on the road. And uh, that's about 16% less road accident. But you know, it's something I would like to mention which is essential because we are now talking about new cars, but the fleet of the vehicles around the world is unfortunately made with most of old cars. And uh, the world is divided in two. You have the developed countries with new cars, with new technology, with law enforcement, and unfortunately you have most of the countries around the world who are not benefiting of new cars who are not under a strong law enforcement where the road infrastructure is very poor and that's where the accidents are coming from and that's where the accidents will increase. That it, was, it has to be put among the priority of the government of those countries to address this problem as a top priority. Let me see, does anyone want to come in? I can't see you all, but I can't see, yes, over there, please. Uh, we've got about six minutes to run. Please, have you got a microphone? And who else might want to come in? Over there as well, good. And over there, three, good. Speak and introduce yourself, please. Um, hi, my name is Zena, and I'm from Egypt. Um, and I was, adding to, I was going to add to a point that Sir 
William made about young people feeling the need for speed. Uh, personally, in, in my country, we have many road accidents and there are many people who are young and who illegally drive irresponsibly and so forth, and they get themselves into accidents and they get injured and they die and things like this. And um, I was, a question that I was going to propose to you is, how in the future can we discourage young people or young men from having the same sort of attitude as Sir William and many of the people that I, I have back home from driving irresponsibly? How do we persuade people? It's a sort of building again, Frank, on what I was asking you earlier. Well, the, the bluntest and most uh, rude and probably not practical form is to take a string of these young men through a mortuary and to see what victims of road accidents look like. And I would assure you, if they were to do that, they'd be driving much more safely. Michelle, is shock the way to do it? Absolutely, yeah, sure. I'm not so sure he's going to ask I think what young people should do for each other is to encourage or deter someone. If you get in the car and you know that it could be a, a, a guy or a girl who has the testosterone running very high and feeling the need for speed, as a sensible person, stop them. If someone has been drinking, it is your duty and obligation on your part too to stop them from driving. I think this is the part where we have to help each other. Apart from the awareness campaigns that, you know, from governments that we can do, you have to help each other and keep each other safe. Thank you. Over there, please. You have... Hello. Um, I'm Max, and I'm from the United States. Um, I remember earlier that in, when addressing the issue of uh, the, the declining, use, declining activist, sports activism of children these days, Koss said, or Johan Koss, said th that the solution should be to tell children to turn off their computers. I'm actually curious if a solution possibly for this is to tell people to turn off their cars and maybe focus more on riding bikes or walking in shorter distances. In other words, don't use your car. <laughs> How do you persuade them? It's, it's impossible, isn't it? If people have bought a car, they've invested, whether here in, in Qatar or in a developing country, and they've skimmed and saved for it. I mean, rather than saying don't use your car or your bike or your uh, bicycle, is use it properly. And your life, and again, if we make a parallel between uh, sport and normal behavior, if you want to have success, you need to have discipline. And uh, all the champions, they have a very strong discipline. They are training. They, they have a way of life which allows them to be better than the other. And if you want to be a good uh, citizen, you have to be full of discipline and respect the other. And here, you see, be courteous and considerate. And that's the only way to respect the society in which you are living. Let's go to one last question. I have to tell you that uh, in London or in Britain, uh, the Times newspaper is running a very a very disturbing campaign about the number of cyclists who have been killed uh, mainly in London. I think the figure is up to over 100 this year. Uh, if I remember rightly from two or three days ago, it's shocking. Um, so the issue of road safety is as much about cyclists as it is about drivers. And, and pedestrians. Yeah. And pedestrians. Yeah. Please, there, we've got three minutes to run. Uh, well, so I'm Kelvin from China, and there's quite some serious traffic problems in our country. <laughs> so, uh, well, uh, here's my question. So, uh, actually, you mentioned previously that uh, kids are a good teacher for parents to educate them to g g uh, uh, get be cautious of uh, road safety. But the problem is, actually, um, a lot of families in China, their parents might get annoyed and might get angry by their kids when they uh, ask their parents to get the safety belt or wait in line or just drive slowly. And sometimes, you know, we have a, a particular, uh, some particular kids called uh, the rich second, second rich generation, which means their parents are really rich and they are really rich too. So they are the ones who, uh, who need the, those speed stuff. 
and often these kids are spoiled and they don't really care about what their parents talk to them and actually their parents influence them little. So All right. uh, for the first... Okay, I, I think we're getting the message. Frank, um, were you being persuaded you were driving too fast when, before you had your accident and what did you say to your family and friends? if they ever said to you? Did they ever risk saying to you, you're driving too fast, Frank? Well, my wife reminded me frequently, but um, I must confess, I worked, mm -hmm, excuse me, I was finished work very late, by like nine o'clock at night. I lived in the country, so at the time of my life, most nights driving home. No headlights coming the other way, it must be all the road. Must all be mine, stupid stuff like that. And whilst I never ever came near having a head-on collision with any other car, the inevitable happened, I was left the road one, one, one evening and finished up in a French hospital. Michelle and John, very quickly, do parents listen to kids? <laughs> Michelle? Well, the thing is, if you're doing something right, you should never be afraid, right? Even if your parents were to get annoyed with you for a split second, at the end of the day, you are doing the right thing and you should persist and pursue that course. Jean, point, point 11, I want to be safe. Tell people to, to be safer. I mean, you know, I. I I mean, maybe to conclude, I will ask all of you to be ambassadors for road safety. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that you are usually getting into the car and you must make sure you put your safety belt and all your passengers will you, with you will put uh, the safety belt and be respectful uh, to the others. But uh, it has to be a very strong solidarity to address this huge scourge, which is a road accident. Right, a huge scourge, which is road accidents. Not central to sport, but it, you are part of it as well. That's the very clear message. Can I thank uh, Jean, uh, Sir Frank, and Michel very much indeed. And before, <laughs> before you dash off, you, it is really lunchtime now, and we'd love to see you back in here um, at 2.30. Remember that, 2.30. And uh, that, uh, the task forces, I should say, that's where you're going next at 2.30, not in here, your task force. And please be there on time because the task force efficiency and effectiveness depends on you being there and contributing.